I hereby open this academic ceremony in which Enrique Geronimo Bezerra Marcos will defend the academic thesis, Consistency in International Law, How to Make Sense of a Decentralized and Expansive Rule-Based World. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. You have 15 minutes. Thank to you. Do so. Dear Prorector, dear Assessment Committee, dear professors, colleagues, friends, and family. I'm here today to present the conclusions of my PhD research, Consistency in International Law, which I hope to do so in 15 minutes or less. Uh, this is a PhD, a double PhD degree between Maastricht University, the Faculty of Law, Department of Foundations and Methods of Law, and uh, the Universidade de São Paulo, Faculty of Law, Department of International Comparative Law. This research began in 2019 at the University of São Paulo under the supervision of Professor Wagner Menezes, and then we uh, integrated it into a double PhD degree at Maastricht University with, under the supervision of Professor Hache and Dr. Antonio Walterman. Uh, basically, in my presentation, I'm going to present a background of my research, well, of the research, the research question that guided my research, my approach, and then a roadmap of the chapters of my dissertation, and focus for a little bit on the conclusions and finish with uh, my intended contribution. So basically what we have in international law is that uh, international law is classically decentralized, different from a national, a domestic legal system where we have legislators, we have a judiciary, we have a centralized executive power. In international law, we have this is generally decentralized. So states are the ones who are signing their own treaties. States are the ones who form uh, courts, and they're the ones who decide whether to be part of courts or not, and they are the ones who executive uh, their own rules. So this leaves the international law decentralized, which is something classic. International law always had the situation, but after the United Nations was formed, and especially after the Cold War went even colder, uh, we had a process called the expansion of international law. So this expansion led to the signature of more treaties, the recognition of more customs, and the uh, finding of more general principles of international law. This decentralized expansion of international law led to many concerns with, uh, especially with the ILC, the International Law Commission, which prepared a couple of works called On the Fragmentation of International Law. In the first work in 2000s, they uh, pointed out to the risks that the situation could lead to, to the fragmentation of international law. And then in 2006, they finished their work and they finished recognizing that regardless of any complication that international law's fragmented character could lead to, it is still a legal system. So with that, in 2017, we have a couple of new publications by some international law scholars uh, bidding us to say farewell to the fragmentation and just focus on the systemic view of international law. We should better focus on the systemic elements of international law and help refine it. This, for example, Ann Peters in 2017, she said we should bid farewell to fragmentation and refine the systemic view. And with that invitation, I began my research. So my research question is basically how uh, legal subjects, that includes not only states, but also uh, lawyers, diplomats, and basically any international organizations, and basically anyone dealing with uh, international law, to how can they make sense of international law despite this decentralized expansion. So how can legal subjects extract a consistent set of legal positions from the international legal rule set, even though international law is decentralized and expanding? So I want to clarify that this is not a strict sense doctrinal research on international law, and it's also not an overview of how scholars in the past have used the term consistency. Not only, it's also not a guide on the literature of consistency in international law. I'm not saying these are not important topics. These, these would not be, I'm not saying this wouldn't be interesting research uh, strategies, but this is not exactly uh, what I've done in my research. Instead, what I've done is a self-contained work in the philosophy of law or legal philosophy, which tries to help international lawyers by trying to address a problem of international law. In this respect, my methods would be conceptual analysis, so I try to improve conceptual apparatuses by making the implicit inner workings explicit in a very Brandomian fashion. And the kind of conceptual analysis I engaged in is something called rational reconstruction, in which we get the concept of consistency, which is the concept under study, and we try to break it apart and bring it back together in a way that makes sense. So my goal was to provide a consistent theory of consistency in international law. 
With that, my dissertation is divided into six chapters. It begins with the introduction, research questions, objectives, etc. Then we go to the decentralized expansion of international law. So chapter two would explain the phenomena and the background that I just spoke about. Then chapter three begins the uh, background or the theoretical building blocks that I use to develop my theory in chapter four. So in chapter three, I talk about how the relationship between facts, rules, and reasons, how rules are entities that attach a fact to another fact, and that rules only apply to cases when the reasons for a rule to apply outweigh the reasons against that rule applying to a case. And in this respect, the reason would be a fact that pleads for a conclusion. With this idea, I go to chapter four, where I talk about reasoning with and about rules. In this chapter, I will develop a logical framework based on a couple of not based on, but deducted from a, a series of axioms that allow me to not only help legal subjects to avoid conflicts, so I go to the idea that introducing more rules can sometimes help avoid conflicts, but also that uh, even if we have conflicts, we can still deal with these conflicts by reasoning with and about rules to find out what rules apply to what cases and what outcomes these rules lead to in the cases before us. So with that idea, we go to, with this framework, we go to chapter five. In chapter five, we do theory application for two illustrative cases, EC hormones and Valles. And finally, we go to the conclusions in uh, chapter six. In essence, uh, the main conclusions that I draw are based on the idea that there's a very substantive difference between rules and statements. Uh, a statement or a descriptive sentence is attempts to fit the world, so it tries to describe the world how it is. A rule, on the other hand, would be not something that tries to describe the world, but something that tries to change the world by impacting it. So with this uh, idea, we have a difference between rules and statements, and this difference between them leads to different concepts of consistency. We would have a S consistency, which is the consistency for statement sets, a uh, statement set is as consistent if all statements in that set can be true at the same time. If they cannot be true, then it's as inconsistent. And we have R consistency when, with respect to rule sets, and a rule set would be R consistent if it cannot lead to conflicts. If it can lead to a conflict, it's R inconsistent. This leads me to my two-part thesis, which is that, first of all, more rules do not always lead to a rule set's inconsistency. Sometimes by adding the right kinds of rules, we can actually avoid conflicts. And the second part, even if a rule set is R inconsistent, we can still extract an S inconsistent, S -consistent statement set on what outcomes obtain as subjects legal positions. And this allows me to derive two corollaries, and these corollaries are especially interesting to international lawyers, which is that first, international law's centralized expansion does not necessarily lead to its R inconsistency, and second, even if an international law's rule set is R inconsistent, subjects can make sense of it by extracting an S consistent set of, stat set of statements on their legal positions, which finally allows me to answer my research question. So again, how can subjects make sense of international law despite its decentralized expansion? I say that subjects can make sense of international law by avoiding and dealing with conflicts. If they can avoid all conflicts, they're left with an R consistent rule set, which is easy to deal with. But even if they face an R inconsistent rule set, they can still deal with conflicts and thus find the legal positions that the rules of international law assign to them. And they can extract this S consistent uh, statement set from an R inconsistent rule set by reasoning with it about rules, which allows them to reveal what rules apply and what outcomes result in their legal positions. To finish my presentation, I would like to point out what I believe are some of the contributions that uh, my work brings or can bring in the future. First one is the, that it, it provides us with a background theory that helps us structure our reasoning with and about rules in international law and would help us uh, deal with the complex issues of international law. There are many issues nowadays that international lawyers are fighting against, struggling against, that I think uh, could be helped with some clarity. Of course, that this clarity and structure would not solve these issues by itself, but it would be an important first step towards solving them. For example, some issues res with respect to the current debate on general principles, the current discussion by the ILC on second category principles can be uh, better understood through my framework. I also believe that the some of the ideas surrounding Jus Kogans, whether Jus Kogans is only uh, 
a lex superior kind of rule or if it has a, a role with regard, regards to validity membership could also uh, be better explained through my theory. I also believe that the relationship between human rights law and humanitarian law, which is something very important nowadays with the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, uh, it's something that could be uh, better understood through the, the framework from my PhD. Just to make this clear, I don't think that the framework by itself solves any, any of these issues, but it's an important first step towards understanding the issues or the essence of what is, is at stake, which can then help us solve the issues. I also believe that my theory can be uh, dealt, can be used to deal with non-international uh, law matters. So for example, we can use part of the framework to better understand the discursive practices of act activists, human rights activists and environmental activists. If we respect or divide their uh, claims as we take their claims as reasons for a conclusion. And we could speak of their meta claims of meta reasons for a conclusion then I also think we could adapt it. And finally, I think there's a very interesting uh, perspective, but it's, this is a bit specul speculative, to use part of the framework for non-legal issues, such as academic writing, legal or not, and the game of giving and asking for reasons in a very uh, Brandomian fashion of what uh, agents engaged in argumentation are entitled to and what they commit to. So with this, I... Thank you for your attention, and I give the floor back to our pro-rector. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation, and we will now start um, the Q&A session. Um, the opposition will be opened by Professor um, Van Dijk. Professor Van Dijk is Professor of Private Law at this university, and he's also the chair of the Assessment Committee. Professor Van Dijk. Thank you, dear Prorector. Dear candidate, congratulations with your thesis. It was quite an interesting read, and I learned a lot of things uh, uh, from it. Uh, and with that, I'll also stop my compliments, not because there's a lot of criticism, uh, but the line of opponents is quite long, and uh, I think it's nice if everybody gets the chance to hear more about your viewpoints, about your, uh, about your thesis. So I'm going to jump into my, uh, my question. In your thesis, as, we, as we've just seen and learned, you propose two kinds of consistency, S uh, consistency, which refers to the consistency of statement sets, and R consistency, which concerns the consistency of rules. My question is how to empirically measure S consistency and R consistency. So how would you operationalize that? Empirical research on, for instance, deontic clauses, such as obligations, permissions, and prohibitions, uh, often claims that a sufficient or even high level of consistency is reached when identifying mentioned modalities. My experience, however, is uh, quite different. Uh, it can be quite a challenge to distinguish between, for instance, a right and a permission, or between an obligation or a power. Is a rule that states a member state shall ensure the protection of the environment, is that a power, an obligation, a right, or neither of the above? When annotating, one problem is that annotators can have difficulties interpreting the different categories. And I think the same might arise for the categories that you introduce. And mistakes are problematic, whether one aims to train a machine learning model or just by formalizing rules in a rule-based manner. In your research, you mentioned examples of S and R consistencies, but those examples are the result of your interpretation, and you could say those are cherry-picked or hand-picked for a reason. Maybe they're good for illustration purposes, but then the question is, if you basically confront your types of rules to reality, you will face a lot of other uh, types of rules that might be more difficult to operationalize and to empirically measure. So my question to you is, what happens if two or more people independently measure, empirically measure, S and or R consistency? Do you believe a high interrelator reliability can be reached when empirically measuring the two types of consistency? If so, how? And if not, why not? I look forward to your answer. Okay. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to begin with your, uh, your point that perhaps the examples are cherry-picked. Uh, the two case studies that I do in my PhD are two case studies that the ILC mentioned that they couldn't deal with or they would be difficult to deal with. Specifically, EC or hormones is a case that they point out as a two-level conflict. And also, Just Paulin in his work uh, mentions EC hormones as a difficult case. We also have Valentin Jotner 
dealing with VC hormones as a uh, irresolvable norm conflict in international law. So that that's my main motivation for picking these two cases. But of course, you can make the claim that these are cherry picked and we could find cases where my theoretical framework uh, is unable to deal with the conflicts. That's part of the scientific game. We could also have more information. That information would be forced me to change my theory. And that's uh, what every scientific activity is subject to. Uh, so you, you asked how do we empirically measure our consistency or S consistency and whether that would be or would not involve my own interpretation of these things. Well, I think that's a very good point. And I think that necessarily that involves interpretation because we would need to have a step from a norm formulation or a rule formulation, an article, and then to the rule. And that necessarily involves interpretation. And in that interpretation, we may interpret different rules from the same provision. Uh, I might read a provision and interpret a completely different rule from you. And then we would need uh, a different theory, one that not focuses on ready-made rules, such as my theory, but a, even a, a previous theory on interpretation. So then we would have a theory, for example, a practical reason approach to interpretation of rule provisions or norm formulations. And then we would derive with the rules themselves, and then we would uh, evaluate whether they're consistent or not. And in that, that respect, I think that my theory is a very direct uh, attempt not to deal with interpretation specifically, but with ready-made rules, as if it assumes we have the rules laid before us. Also, this also deals with uh, the kind of approach I take in my PhD, which is a monological approach. I do agree that the law has a very important argumentative character to it, but it's a monological approach in the sense that I'm thinking of what the legal subject uh, that wants to find out what the law expects from her and what she should do to reason about rules to find out what her legal positions are. So with th these points, I want to go to your uh, point, which is what happens if two or more people independently measure our consistency and as consistency. And let's say one person uh, interprets a list of legal provisions into a set of rules one and the different person interpret that same legal set of legal provisions into a different set of rules R S2. Then in that case, uh, just again to emphasize, that would be a little bit beyond what I'm focusing on the PhD because my PhD is the first step, is the first step literally when the person looks at the provisions, interpret the rules, and tries to find a way to deal with them. And then the next step, which would be something profoundly interesting, would be the argumentative engagement between these two persons to perhaps provide for a coherent position set between them. And then we could engage into a discussion on giving and asking for reasons between them. We could see this as an intersection between these two sets and the positions to which they're both uh, committed to. Let's say the rules they agree with one another would be out of the discussion. And then they would discuss and try to advance arguments in favor or against one another to the introduction or the exclusion of their interpretations. So I'd see it that way, but it's, it's, it's again, it's profoundly interesting, but it's a, it's a second step after my PhD. It's one that I'm very interested to do in my postdoc. Thank you, that sounds like a very balanced and fair answer. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay, thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Bustamante. Professor Bustamante is um, Professor of Philosophy of Law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. So good morning to you, Professor. And um, allow me to wish you a warm welcome here to Maastricht University Online. Professor Busamante, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will also congratulate the candidate, but I will do it very quickly because we need to move on to the question. Um, so in your, in your, in your work, you begin saying that your work is a self-contained work on the philosophy of law. And then you say that uh, you will attempt to assist lawyers through uh, statements from, from this analytic legal philosophy. This is not how analytic philosophers usually see themselves. They think of them as doing a second uh, level uh, sort of statements that will merely describe the law instead of change or changing it. And, and I think that uh, you, you can find this, the, this problem also when you speak about rules uh, and, and normative proposition. Uh, if, you, if, we look, if, you, if we go back to Hans Kelsen, for instance, he thinks that legal science make, makes uh, 
normative uh, propositions uh, instead of norms because it merely describes the law. And this description is neutral because it, it, it doesn't have any normative purport. It doesn't need to change the law. And I think that uh, at some point, you, you, you kind of uh, confuses this, this distinction because you claim that this analytic philosophy that will merely make uh, descriptive propositions, they will, um, uh, they will make a practical difference and will change the way that uh, we interpret the law, the way that we uh, understand the law. And I think that this is, is, is not, um, is not what, what you're trying to do that. Because if you do that, you will not be doing merely conceptual analysis. You will be speaking of, about norms. We usually interpret uh, uh, legal materials like statutes, international treaties, uh, precedents in order to arrive at a norm formulation. But now it, it seems that uh, you take rules to be the object of interpretation instead of the conclusion of interpretation. And, and I think that this, this is a little bit confusing. So I would like to hear more about uh, whether or not you think that uh, your analysis is analytic and conceptual, because I don't think that it can have the practical import and the practical consequences that you want to draw if you regard them uh, in that way, because you, you won't be speaking merely about uh, descriptive statements. Um, at one point, you say that uh, the difference between rules and statements is that rules cannot be true or false, while statements can be true or false. So you, you, you presuppose a Kelsenian vocabulary, but you want to think of uh, the nature of science in a very different way from Kelsen and other analytical philosophers. So I would like to hear you more about that. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, okay, so let's go. So, so divided in many parts, but I, I think I, I got everything down. If I didn't, please uh, correct me. Well, to begin, you when I speak of analytic legal philosophy, and then you, you say that in general, legal philosophers who do analytic legal philosophy are interested in just describing the law and not proposing any normative prescriptions on the law. Well, uh, I think that this is even not in the actual PhD, but if we go to the propositions at the end of the PhD, if I'm not mistaken, it would be proposition seven or eight, P proposition nine. And it's about the difference between description and prescription in scientific activities. And contemporary philosophy of science would say that there's not a very uh, strict distinction between describing and prescribing things in science. And when scientists aim to only describe things, in fact, they're actually prescribing a whole lot of things. If we go read the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on the normativity of language, you could see that any linguistic practice it is, is in itself normative. So even if my goal as an analytic philosopher would be to solely describe what the law is, I would be inherently prescribing some meaning to it, so I would have a normative goal to it. Uh, in that respect, we could go to the distinction, and this would be more of a, let's say, not even academic, but even scholastic distinction between uh, what is, what's the purpose of analytic philosophy or whether analytic philosophy can have any actual impact or whether it can have any uh, practical propositions or if it's only a very abstract description. And that would be, I think, a very interesting discussion, but uh, I don't see how it would uh, take my, my, my thesis from its two feet. The, way I, I, the reason why I, I said this is an, an analytic study is that I wanted to make sure that my reader knew first that wasn't a normal, traditional doctrinal study, and second, it wasn't uh, a study that would be focused on making ethical or political claims. Of course, even if, even if I've tried my best to do a very cold, abstract reading of international law, I am making value judgments about it. I think that it's anyone who does any description of the law is necessarily making value judgments about the law. So that's, that's something I, I do not claim to not have done in the PhD. I, I don't remember saying, that in my PhD, I'm merely describing from a very uh, neutral, I don't even think I, I say that in any way because I don't think I am. Uh, so that's, that's the first part. Second, 
you say that rules is the object of interpretation, not the result of interpretation. I honestly, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I think that rules would be the result of interpretation if we take a very strict sense definition of interpretation. Fabio Shekaria, I think from Minas Gerais as well, has a very good paper uh, published in Hasio Iuris where he speaks about the difference between norm provisions and uh, norm propositions, the provisions of law and the result. And he uh, urges us not to confuse the two. And I agree with him. I think that rules would be the object of interpretation. Perhaps the issue there is that uh, lawyers and I myself may be guilty of that. We use interpretation with many different meanings at the same time. We speak of interpretation as just legal reasoning. We speak of interpretation as argumentation. We speak of interpretation as what we do every day. And also as the step from the text to the law, to the rule, or something like that. And as I pointed out to Professor Van Dyck, I do not focus on interpretation in the sense of from norm provisions to rules or from rule provisions to uh, actual rules in this work, but I do think it's a very important issue. It's just that uh, if I were to also have engaged in that, I would be not giving the full attention that the topic of my dissertation uh, deserves. So that's why I focus not to deal with that, but deal with only rules. Again, I'm not dealing with the step from formulations to rules. I'm dealing exclusively with, with rules. And I emphasize that on chapter three and in chapter four. Uh, oh, I, I have a little detail, but should I stop? Little, very little. You, you, you talked about conceptual analysis and uh, you're saying that a conceptual analysis would be just the analysis of a concept. That's a traditional point of view on conceptual analysis. If we go to Carnap's uh, The Logical Structure of the World, he would uh, divide conceptual analysis into a psychologist conceptual analysis and rational reconstruction. And rational reconstruction would not be focused on merely describing thoughts about things, but also rebuilding it. If we also go to the last paragraph of Brandom's Make It Explicit, he also says that. That's it. Okay. I will stop you here. And the opposition will now be continued by Professor Verhey. Professor Verhey is also a member of the assessment committee and he is a professor of artificial intelligence and argumentation at uh, the University of Groningen. And to you as well, welcome to Maastricht. Thank you. Uh, esteemed candidate, uh, I enjoyed very much uh, reading your thesis, uh, of course, uh, because of its uh, excellent writing style and its conceptual analysis very carefully done, and also the in inter interesting applications in case studies. But of course, also because soon we will be brothers by our supervision, <laughs> so uh, that is very nice. Uh, um, but let's talk about uh, research. So you also struggled with uh, the balancing of different methodologies. You already mentioned that also in your talk. So mm -hmm. you said it's self-contained uh, legal philosophy. But also you tried, of course, to make the different sides of what is relevant for your work uh, uh, also uh, do justice to that. So on the one hand, there is legal theory, legal logic or something like that. On the other hand, there are the lawyers the international lawyers especially, and you try to keep both sides happy. Mm -hmm. And it's rather a puzzle. I remember that also from my times in Maastricht, it was not so easy to balance all mm -hmm. that. So I would like to ask you how you solve that, how you address that balancing between methods. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I, I began my, my PhD in a very traditional doctrinal sense. Uh, my PhD was basically an attempt to provide a systemic interpretation of international law. But then I started to, to take many, many courses on legal philosophy, especially on the writing of philosophy. And then I engaged with the traditional methods of writing philosophical pieces in the sense that we have an opponent who presents a view A, and we present a view not A, and then we try to prove why his view is wrong, our view is right. In that regard, my PhD began uh, here in Maastricht already as presenting in the first chapter, Kuskaniemi and Dupuis' views as my opponents. And then I would criticize both of their views and then present my alternative view. So I would, I, I would do, answering your question specifically, I would try to engage with legal theorists in, these, in the beginning, in these initial chapters, and then I would go to my view would be a view based more on legal philosophy, legal theory. But uh, after many discussions with the supervising committee, uh, we decided that it, to my audience of international lawyers, because I, I'm not sure if I was successful at that, but I was always thinking of international lawyers while writing this book. And I think that to my audience, such a 
discussion between authors from a very abstract point of view would not be so interesting. So we focused more on presenting the background. And in the background, I take the point of view of lawyers as playing the role of the background. So there we present Dupuis, Damas Marti, Benvenisti, uh, my resident supervisor, Menezes as well. Uh, and then Koskenyemi, who was had a chapter is now reduced to a single footnote and then we go to the next chapter and then we engage in philosophy uh but that that's how i approach this quick follow-up yes yeah, so uh, because this sounds uh, super interesting and also carefully done so uh, one thing that also struck me at the end has to do with all this and that is that you say uh, in the final page i think it is uh, in uh, true Popperian fashion, et yes. cetera, et cetera, um, perhaps my thesis or elements of that will be rebutted. Mm -hmm. And I was then thinking, because you don't say much about that, would that what would that even imply, both for the theoretical part mm -hmm. and for the more doctrinal part? So mm -hmm. what would it mean if it is rebutted? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for your, the, the addition. Uh, I think that from the theoretical part, from the doctrinal part, I'll, take, I'll make use of uh, Professor Van Dyck's question. If, for example, we have a, a big change in international law, we have the addition of very different rules of international law, and we start to see that my theory doesn't adapt itself, it doesn't, is not able to solve these issues, it would be uh, I would have to change it, or someone else would have to change it, or just disregard it. So I think that this, this I don't even reference Popper because at the conclusions we can't actually add any more references, but his idea that the central element of the scientific activity is to acknowledge that we are uh, open to being refuted. So I think it would be that. From the legal theorist point of view, that would be it. From the philosophical point of view, even though I've done my best to make sure that my uh, theory is internally consistent. Of course, I'm, I'm a fallible human being. It, perhaps it is, there is a flaw there. If someone finds a flaw, it is, well, it's inconsistent. It sounds uh, like your method is something like argumentative discussion anyway. Yes. Like everything always, right? So that's what lawyers do every day. Yes. So, well, okay, thank you. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued um, by Professor uh, Macedo. Professor Macedo is a professor of philosophy of law at the University of Sao Paulo uh, and a member of the assessment committee. So a warm welcome to you as well, Professor, from, um, to Maastricht University online. The floor is now yours. Thank you, dear rector. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my first question is basically uh, a demand for clearing some concepts. Uh, it's, it's not always clear what is the concept of, of rule that is used in the work. Sometimes uh, the reader has the impression that the Wittgensteinian approach is adopted and at the other time a more stipulative definition is used. By the way, uh, I would say that the same kind of uh, commentary should be said concerning the notions of rationality and reason. And uh, a, a connected point is that it's not, it's not clear how the methodology proposed, the interpretive methodology fits well with the idea of consistency. Should, should it be understood as a kind of integrity in a Dworkinian uh, sense, or should we understand as a mere coherence? If so, in what sense? Or should it either uh, be conceived in logical terms? So this will be my, my points. Thank you. And congratulations for the first Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, so three questions. Let's begin with uh, the concept of rules. I reference Wittgenstein, if I'm not mistaken, three or four times in my work. And two of these times is just to point out that Wittgenstein, alongside Schauer, Hart, and 
Sartre, if I'm not mistaken, and a couple of other authors use the concept of rule. We use the term rule to refer to rules, principles, etc. This is specifically in a very similar light as to the postscript in Hart's concept of law, the third edition. So the sense that working was criticizing Hart because he only spoke of rules, and Hart says, well, when I speak of rules, I'm also including principles. So this is one of the, 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 the moments I cite Wittgenstein in my work. The second moment when I cite Wittgenstein is when I also cite Postuma, Glock, and yeah, I think it's Postuma and Glock. And it's basically in chapter three when I speak about rule application. Chapter one as well when I point that out, but it's when I speak about rule application. Wittgenstein uh, introduces the very interesting idea that rule following and practices built around rules are practices that depend on public practices. So the idea is that we cannot rule, uh, follow rules in isolation. We cannot follow rules in a vacuum. We need people and we need public practices. People individually do not follow rules. That's Wittgenstein's claim. And in a very, very comprised nutshell. Uh, but uh, I use this idea alongside Postuma because of the notion of rule application I use in my work. Different from uh, Duarte de Almeida in a 2021 publication, Law and Philosophy, where he speaks about rule application as something that is agent-based, I talk of rule application as something that is done by a collective. So the point is that it's not a judge or a court individually applying a rule to a case. It's the collective that applies the rules to the case through reasons which are collectively recognized as social facts. And in this respect, I deal with I use Wittgenstein, I also use Postuma, when Postuma speaks of rule practices as collective practice, community practices, just to make that clear, that I'm not speaking of agent-based rule application, but still, uh, but collective rule application in the sense that it's not agent A who applies rule R to KC, but rule R which applies itself to KC if the reasons for R to apply outweigh the reasons against R to apply. We can speak of that later if you need a, an addition, but moving on to your second question. Oh, so. Still on the first question, just on the concept of rules, just to clarify it, I, I don't think it's a Wittgensteinian concept of rules. I just use Wittgenstein for this. My concept of rules is clarified in chapter three. If I'm not mistaken, section 3.3, there's four pages there defining rules, and a rule is basically an entity that attaches effect one to effect two. So this is my speculative definition of rules. If we move on to the concept of rationality and reasons. Well, rationality is used very few times in my PhD, if I'm not mistaken. And I use rationality as something that has to do with reasons. So I could say that it is rational for me to come here to my defense today because the reasons pleading for me to come here to my defense today outweigh the reasons pleading against it. So that's it. I perhaps should have uh, made that clearer, but I, I, I think that when I used it alongside the idea of, ra of reasons, I thought it was uh, evident. But I could add a footnote just pointing out that rational means reason Latin. Uh, but with regards to the concept of reasons, con reasons are uh, defined in chapter three. I use a factualist definition of reasons. This draws from Alvarez's work where she speaks of reasons as facts and she speaks of reasons as explanatory reasons reasons that explain why something happened or someone did something. We speak of motivating reasons, reasons why some, someone was felt motivated to do something. And we speak of justifying reasons, reasons that justify the acting of someone or justify why something ought to be the case. So these, the, any reason would be a fact. Most likely, in, with regards to our legal practice, it would be a social fact. And these social facts plead uh, for a certain conclusion. That's it. We could speak of epistemic and constitutive reasons if you want, but I'll, given the time, I'll, I'll shift to the third question, which is on, it is not clear why interpretive methodolo methodology rounds well the concept of consistency as Dworkinian integrity or coherence in logical terms. I speak of interpretivism in the introduction, and I say that I draw from interpretivism, particularly from the idea that rules are bound by the purposes of law. So I do not adopt uh, interpretivism. I do not adopt Dworkin's views of law of integrity. I don't have anything against the views. I think we could have done the PhD adopting its views. It would be somewhat different. Some ideas of justice for hedgehogs would be interesting for this work, but I do not adopt it. I just draw on his theory, particularly on the element that rules have a purpose and they try to follow and try to 
uh, accomplish the purposes of the law. So that's what I'm, I was focusing on. And this is particularly the idea of rule-sensitive particularism that Postuma uh, elaborates on positivism, I presume. So in the concept of consistency is developed in chapter four. And I presented the, the slides here. I can go back to it. But basically, we have two concepts of consistency. Yeah, here it is. So two concepts of consistency, S consistency and R consistency. S consistent for statement sets, R consistency for rule sets. That's my answer. And I see Professor Macedo nodding, so he's pleased with the response for now. Um, the opposition will now be continued by Professor Widmar. Professor Widmar is Professor of International Law at this university. Professor Wittmar, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Prorector. Um, dear candidate, you start and end with metaphors about games. So let me challenge your theoretical foundations in a bit similar way. Mm. Now imagine that we here have a few sets of cards. We could decide to play various games with these cards. We could play poker. We could play bridge, we, we could play rummy, and so on. It would then be our social choice which card game we would choose to play, and for what purposes. And then once we made this choice, we would need to follow the rules of that particular game. And different card games may have quite different rules, but then there is some basic understanding of what, um, what are diamonds, what are spades, what are queens, what are kings, and so on. So it would be quite impossible um, to find some meta system that would explain the rules of all possible card games and why would we actually even need such a meta system. Now, um, going to international law, um, I'm wondering whether the absence of a comprehensive meta system in international law really is as problematic as he appears to suggest. And whether this issue hasn't really been or hasn't actually already been convincingly explained uh, by the ILC fragmentation report in 2006, to which you actually refer uh, quite extensively. Now, prove me um, wrong, if I'm wrong, that you are finding all these conceptual problems because you're trying to compare international law to the comprehensive public law system domestically. And of course, you don't find much of that in public international law. But if your benchmark were domestic public law, it suddenly wouldn't be so strange that the actors can create legal obligations in relations with one another. Um, but the private law analogies are nothing new in international law. Lauterpacht was writing about that some hundred years ago. So my questions to you are, um, aren't you trying to compare international law to domestic public law while overlooking the private law logic behind it? Mm -hmm. uh, why would we even need a comprehensive meta system behind international law? And do you really think it is the actors who are trying to make sense of international law? Or is it, in fact, scholars who are trying to do that, while the actors are perfectly happy with the situation as it is? And finally, um, how much beyond the I ILC fragmentation report in 2006 does your thesis go? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, okay, let's start from the, the beginning. I, from a very authorial point of view, I think that I'm incapable of uh, comparing international, well, not incapable, but I wouldn't have compared international law or used domestic law as the benchmark because I'm profoundly ignorant towards uh, domestic law. I've been doing international law ever since I finished my bachelor's and I've worked as a lawyer for 10 years dealing just with international law. So I, I don't even have a benchmark on domestic law. So I'm, 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 I draw all my work from international law and I try to deal with the problems within the 
logic of international law. That's even one of the propositions in the end that I complain that lawyers in general try to say, say ever since uh, Austin, they tried to say that international law is not really law because it lacks X, Y, and Z categories of, that defines law as law. And I'm always saying, why, why are these categories what defines law as law? And of course, I don't deal with this topic specifically in my PhD because I assume that international law is law. Uh, but uh, so this is the first part. Also, are you trying to compare international law with comparing domestic law? No, I don't, I don't even think I don't even think I have a, 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 a benchmark or standard to compare it to because I, I lack it. Second, you mentioned the game metaphor, and I really like that metaphor. It's a very interesting metaphor. And uh, if we we already spoke about Wittgenstein today, and I would like to point out that. Uh, it's an interesting idea because we don't have a definition for games, right? Uh, the uh, definition of game would be family resemblances between themselves. So we, we can't actually have a perfect definition of what is a game. Uh, but then your, I think your metaphor is very good. I really like it. But there's an issue there. Is that different from your metaphor where we pick a game and we play that game? In international law, we're playing all games at the same time. When we have an issue that deals with trade law, that issue also affects the environment. So we're not only subject to the laws of trade law, but also subject to the laws of environmental law. And if we are European, uh, dealing with an European state, it would be not only subject to the rules of the UN system, but also the rules of the EU system. And if we gonna go a step forward, we would also be subject to rules of a domestic system. So then we would, we would need a meta system in so far as we need a consistent interpretation of what all, all these rules expect from us. So this is question two, why do we even need a comprehensive media system for international law? Finally, are truly actors who want consistency not scholars? It's a very interesting point, very interesting point, because if we think about it, uh, you're right. If we think about it from a geopolitical point of view, in practice, most uh, diplomats, lawyers, etc., are representing interests. So they're not trying to make consistency. They're not trying to see what the law expects from them. They're trying to find out what they can do with the law, right? But then there's a very important category of, all the, of subjects, which, at least in my opinion, should be worried about what the law expects from them. Judges. These judges, if they're professional judges, if they're virtuous people, if they're interested in issuing uh, impartial judgments, they would not be interested in what they can do with the law, but what the law expects from them and what they should, how they should decide. Uh, also, I take this approach not only for judges, but also within uh, Hart's internal point of view. I'm interested in the legal subject, even if this legal subject is hypothetical, that would be interested in what the law expects from her. So it's not a legal subject that wants to manipulate the law, but it wants to do what is the right thing to do from the internal point of view. Finally, how much beyond the 2006 ILC report do you go? Uh, I have serious criticism against the, the 2006 ILC report. I think that just to start, it doesn't even define what fragmentation is. There are eight definitions of fragmentation. And most of them are contradictory. Also, they use some concepts of principles such as lex specialis, lex superior, uh, lex posterior, but they don't define them. And the issue of lack of clarity is being felt nowadays into the 2019 report on the ILC. The ILC is now dealing with principles and many of the issues that haven't been dealt with during the uh, fragmentation report are resurfacing now. So I think that the only way to stop the cycle of pushing the issues to the next report and the next one after that is if we deal with these way in a very clear manner, structured manner. So I think that my research aims to help start the discussion and start to structure these discussions in international law. Can I have a short follow-up or? Um, no. Uh, OK, OK, thank you. I may come back to you, but first I would like to give the floor to the next opponent. So the opposition will be continued by Professor Pirek, who is Professor of Philosophy of Law at this university. Professor Pirek. Thank you, uh, dear Prorector. First, I'd like to join my colleagues in congratulating you with the dissertation. It is a robust work in legal theory, and both the style and the form make clear that the dissertation is written in the academic tradition here, here in Maastricht, is rightly associated with Jaap Hagen and Antonia um, Waltemann. So, congratulations to you and your supervisors. I would like to spend the next few minutes to challenge you on the application of the theoretical chapters, uh, three and four in the field in which you have written the dissertation, namely international law. The thesis is entitled Consistency in International Law, <clears throat> and the subtitle makes it clear, 
uh, that it seeks to make sense of international law as a decentralized and ever expensive domain of law. In chapter two, you describe these processes very well. In order to make sense of this, these processes, in chapter three and four, you develop a conceptual model that aims to break down the phenomenon into its constituent parts in order to gain a better understanding of the issue at hand, namely international law, its consistency and the lack thereof. But I am less convinced that your thesis really provides a genuine answer to the question of international law as a decentralized and expensive rule set. The reason is that these are systemic characters. The decentralized and expensive nature of international law are characters of the legal system as a whole. But your theory does not approach international law as a system. Instead, it provides answers when we encounter unclarity with a specific rule in a specific constellation. You analyze how, specific rule, how a specific rule applies in a specific case. And you show that if pro reasons outweigh the con reasons, we might be obligated to do a certain action. And step by step, you develop the model, for example, by distinguishing the gap between applicability and the application of rule, etc. Again, I'm impressed by the theoretical framework. You develop no qualms there. But my point is that the whole theoretical framework does not deal, per se, with the decentralized and expensive nature of international law uh, as systematic characteristics of the system as a whole. Instead, it remains focused on solving isolated problems of uncertainty concerning the legal position of a specific person when it is unclear how, in one single case, a specific rule or a conflicting set of rules applies them. And of course, the number of these problems of incom incompatible outcomes might increase as a result of the further decentralization and expansion of international law. But I don't think that the character of the problem itself meaningfully changes. Indeed, even within domestic law, such problems are abundantly available. So my question is, is your theoretical approach really, as the title and introduction of the book suggests, an answer to the problem of the decentralization and expansion of international law? Or is it a framework that solves much more general problems in domestic and international law? How to make sense of an isolated problem and how, when a, le how a legal rule applies in one single complex case? Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, I want to I want to begin going back to the discussion on fragmentation, and I think there there is a an, a, a word a reason why I don't write the subtitle of my book as dealing with a fragmented legal system. I speak of a decentralized and expensive uh, rule-based world. Uh, I, I do so because, again, going back to Professor Vidmar's question, uh, I, I don't use the benchmark of domestic legal systems, so I'm not trying to turn international law into a sort of centralized and not expensive rule set. I'm not, the, the subtitle should have been, if I were to do that, reforming or changing or adapting or centralizing and stopping the expansion of international law, something like that. I'm not concerned with doing that. I'm more concerned with helping legal subjects, as I said, make sense of this rule set. And in practice, when they deal with cases, uh, they deal with applicable rules that each are pointing to a different conclusion, and they need to find a way around these rules and make sense of them. What do you expect from them? And then you said that uh, it might, I provide answers when we engage in particular issues, and the whole theoretical framework does not deal with the centralized expensive character. Uh, I think I deal with the way subjects should deal with a decentralized expansive character. I'm not trying to solve the decentralized and expansive character because I don't assume that that's an issue of international law. I think that not only international law as a rule-based world, but also many of our rule-based practices are decentralized and expansive. For instance, language is decentralized. We don't have a central authority deciding who makes language, and it's expensive because words are growing every day. So, and this is a, a, a rule-based world that works. We are able to communicate and understand one another in general. Uh, so I think that that's not what I'm trying to do. Second, you speak of uh, focusing on particular elements, particular rules, and not the whole system at the time. Uh, if we go, there's a fantastic paper by Bulijing, which is the 
eulogy he wrote to Al Shahon when he passed away. It's in the 2015 issue of the South American Journal of Logic. And then he speaks of the element of completeness, the idea of completeness of a legal system. And uh, he criticizes Kelsen, who sees uh, legal systems as complete. And he criticizes Kantorovich, who sees legal systems as necessarily incomplete. And his claim is that we should not try to deal with legal systems at the whole, at, at all the times. We deal with microsystems. This is his wording. I would say, uh, I don't use the word microsystem, microsystem in this work. I use the concept of rule sets or sub rule sets. So when we are before a case, uh, legal subjects are dealing with a subset of applicable rules and they try to make sense of it. They're not dealing with all rules of international law because there are many rules that are not applicable, many rules that don't bring any issue. So that, yes, that's my, my answer. Okay, thank you so much. Um, then the opposition will be continued by Professor Leinzat. Professor Leinzat is Professor of International Law at this university, and she's also a member of the Assessment Committee. She could not, however, be here today, but she has sent a question that will be read by Professor Van Dijk. I'm not going to pretend that I'm Professor Leinzat, <laughs> but you know her, so maybe you can imagine that I am Professor okay. Leinzat. Dear candidate, I'm very sorry not to be present today to discuss your PhD thesis, and I hope it will be a festive event now that the work is done and the book is ready. It has been a pleasure to have regular discussions with you about your research, about living and working in two different countries, and about the impact of the pandemic on our lives. You seem to do well, and I had a general sense you were moving of moving forward with your research. This book proves that this was the right impression. The book is concise, it is well organized, and you have dealt successfully with a complex theoretical issue. Initially, my question would have been about why do we need to look for consistency in international law to begin with? Life and research is so much more fun when things do not really fit, are counterintuitive, are incoherent, or even inconsistent. It must be the philosopher in you who was attracted to the problem of inconsistency, wanting to have a solution at theoretical level while the practitioner in me would live with inconsistencies and find a practical solution. But that is not the question. As we must address some comments you have made about the law of the sea and the contiguous zone in particular. You discuss this in paragraph five of the chapter about avoiding conflict in subparagraph 4.5.2 on validity. I was a little surprised by the example you used for various reasons. Your comments with respect to the contiguous zone are very much focused on article 311 of UNCLOS in comparison with article 24, section one of the 1958 convention on the territorial sea and the contiguous zone learning a lot about the uh, law of the sea here. <laughs> to begin with, the contiguous zone is perhaps in practice more of a possible tool for the enforcement of norms applicable in the territorial sea and hardly an elaborate maritime zone in itself. It exists and may be used by the coastal state, but it has little substance other than providing additional geographical space for enforcement jurisdiction. However, Article 24 of the 1958 Convention on the Territorial Sea and the Continental Shelf is similar, if not identical to Article 33 of UNCLOS, apart from paragraph 24, section three of the 1958 Convention that has not been repeated in UNCLOS. Mm. I am not sure why you make a comparison between Article 311 of UNCLOS and Article 24. In Dutch, we would say that you are comparing apples and pears my question is, why are you doing this? And I have some more questions, but looking at the time, maybe you can focus on this question first. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is a highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think that this is, if we go to exactly this, this sentence, uh, I have a citation to Travis, 2008. This is a course he gave uh, at the United Nations, and he's talking about the abrogation of rules. My only purpose with this uh, example and it's a very simple example, is that we have some rules on the Law of the Sea Convention, and these rules would, would conflict with the rules in the Geneva Conventions on the Law of the Sea, but because the Law of the Sea Convention 
uh, adds a provision that invalidates the rules that are contradicting the previous ones, then these uh, Geneva Conventions rules are no longer applicable. So we had on the first moment, the Geneva Conventions, they said X, and then we have the Law of the Sea Convention came after in the second moment, it said not X, and then uh, if it were just that, we would have a conflict. But the issue is that we have a meter rule in the Law of the Sea Convention that says that whatever rules in the Geneva Conventions are conflicting or contradictory, they're no longer applicable. So, given that they're no longer applicable, they cannot conflict. That's the only purpose I had. If you wish, you may finalize your question or... Sure, yeah. yeah, but I, I think that's it. I think that's, that's it. It's, it's a very simple example, just because uh, the Law of the Sea Convention mentions uh, a rule that would conflict with the CTCSZ, and it doesn't conflict because the CTCSZ rules are no longer valid. That's it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Enrique Geronimo Bezara Marcos. The time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberation and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Get the mileage, Yeah, 
bye bye now, don't waste all your time. Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile.
to get into the train station. I'm gonna put this here for you. Enrique Geronimo Bezara Marcos. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense, and in view of its positive assessment and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Hage is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? I promise. I won't do it again. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Henrique Geronimo Bizarra Marcos, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Enrique, dear all, first of all, warmest congratulations with this wonderful achievement. I briefly, and I will keep it brief, want to sketch the story of your PhD, which has been exceptional in many ways, including in how it started. At the end of 2019, Jaap received an email from a complete stranger from Brazil asking to become a PhD student under his supervision. Unlike most such requests, you did not ask for a paid job, you asked for supervision. You aimed at a double degree, not only here in Maastricht, but also in Sao Paulo, and you already had a supervisor in Sao Paulo. Um, Professor Menezes, who is here present with us today, very much stimulated you to strive for this double degree took care of the supervision as far as international law was concerned, which is a very important extent in your work. Also, and perhaps most exceptionally, unlike many cold call requests that one receives, what you initially sent was more than promising enough to accept the challenge um, and to start the supervision. And Yap then promptly reached out also to me um, and I concurred that um, this was a fascinating project to get involved in. Things continued exceptionally after that, again, in many ways. Um, the first year, our exchanges were predominantly via email or via Zoom, very frequently. You proved yourself a quick study and an even quicker reader, and you showed a remarkable amount of knowledge of international law and of legal theory, while we, Yap and myself try to limit the amount of knowledge that would actually be included in the thesis. Um, our motto was always that the knowledge that was not directly necessary to prove the conclusion should be demonstrated by avoiding errors rather than 
by explicit inclusion in the text. And you've proven yourself more than up for that particular challenge. Already at an early stage of our cooperation, it was a two-way street. You invited us to contribute to conferences, and there have been many projects that we have worked on together, so next to your PhD, um, in a collaborative and collegial fashion. One aspect of the double degree project was that you would come to Maastricht for a time to work with us more closely and actually physical presence. Early 2001, you and also your wife, Fernanda, arrived in a then snow-covered Maastricht, hard to imagine today given the weather, with COVID at that time still in full swing. This does not make or did not make the integration at the time easier, but we found many solutions around that, particularly organizing outdoor activities, cycling, and many other such things, which fortunately spring of that year had weather as we are seeing now as well. Um, so that was very much possible. In that year, you also contributed to our faculty's educational tasks by teaching various courses that you proved very, very adept at as well. Meanwhile, you continued working on your thesis, developing the idea that the consistency of public international law could be restored by adopting more rather than less law. At the end of 2001, you had to leave us again for Brazil, so it was a bit of a back and forth, after a short break at our friends in Lisbon at the Lisbon Legal Theory Group. The year after that, we're now in 22, you worked on finishing your PhD in Brazil. Our contacts were again limited to email to Zoom. We were very, very happy when at the start of 23, you could return to Maastricht again. Not only had a gifted colleague returned to us, but also a good friend who has now today received his doctoral degree from Maastricht. Again, warmest congratulations with that. Next week, moving into the future now, the thesis will also be defended in Sao Paulo. Double degree will become complete. From the Maastricht perspective, the story of your PhD ends here. We wish you and you a prosperous future stay in Maastricht. That's the Maastricht side of the story. But there is, of course, also a Brazilian perspective. And I invite Professor Wagner Menezes to elaborate a little bit on that perspective. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Yap and Professor Antonia for accepting to work with a Latin American and Brazilian professor. For me, it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot from it. I would like to thank uh, the Maastricht University that made my participation here possible. Henrique, today is a special day for you and mainly for me. I remember six years ago when we began the discussion about your ideas concerning your thesis, the idea of fragmentation, international law, systemic law, consistency. So, at the time, I noticed that I was before a potential high-level professor and researcher. So, you made your thesis with courage, seriousness, dedication, 
reflection. And your work will be an important contribution to the academy. And today, after your defense, I have no doubt that a great professor and researcher is born. Congratulations and good luck. Henrique, thank you for sharing your academic journey with me. Dear Dr. Marcos, also on behalf of Maastricht University, on behalf of its rector, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, the Graduate School of Law and the entire Faculty of Law, I too congratulate you with the degree you have just acquired. Um, now, what we're now going to do is uh, there will be a reception and the Beadle will um, accompany uh, your company to the reception. Um, we, the committee and yourself, will stay in this room and um, make a picture in accordance with the faculty uh, traditions um, and then later join your company for the reception. And with this, I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>